I could never really understand why my mother and father were were friendly with them, but um, I could, as a 12-year-old boy, I couldn't see that they had anything in common. But they were, and looking back on it now, I, I think that it was more a friendship of convenience than, than affection, because the Reeves um, lived um, not quite in the countryside, but at the end of a end of a row where they had an extra long garden and they had some outbuildings uh, in in the garden and in one of them, my father, who was a butcher, uh, kept a pig. Well, of course, it wasn't unusual for people in the wartime to uh, keep animals to supplement the food. Uh, rationing uh, chickens and rabbits but where and, and whether it was legal to keep a pig I, I never knew but I guess in times of conflict um, one has to do what one has to do to survive uh, anyway um, it was often the case on a Friday night that um, Mr. and Mrs. Reeves and my mother and father would go out. Uh, I knew that they went to went to a pub, and in my juvenile mind, um, I, it seemed to be something that I, I I didn't I didn't like and didn't want to see them do, and I felt that uh, my mother coming back with the smell of smoke and beer on her clothes which normally she would smell of pears, soap and lavender that they were doing something that they were doing something wicked and of course I, I blamed him uh, I never I never liked him and um, it, it, it was something that um, something that distressed me Children in those days only referred to adults by their title, so to me they were always Mr. and Mrs. Reeves. And I never knew their Christian names. But whatever his name had been, it was Mr. Reeves who I blamed for what I envisaged was the corruption of my mother. Oh, he, he frightened me. He was he was big, and his hair was cut very short, um, like you might imagine somebody who had been in prison, which I knew he hadn't, but he, he gave me that impression. And uh, although his hair was short, his eyebrows were very bushy, and um, they reminded me of a... Um, you know, those bloodhound dogs that have their uh, skin that forms over their eyes and um, um, it all added to his lugubrious appearance and, and terrified me. I certainly made no eye contact with Mr Reeves and uh, no words had ever passed between us and um, his belly bulged over a wide leather belt which reminded me of the leather strop on which barbers used to hone their cutthroat razors, which put him in my eyes into the same category as Sweeney Todd, the murderer. So I didn't like him. Uh, I never knew where he was employed because he, he was only home at the weekends. And I asked Dad once, um, uh, you know, what he did and uh, we were told that we were not allowed to know. He said that he worked in London and was connected in some government department, in some sort of ministry, and he was involved in secret work. And so no more questions were asked. When they left, with Mr Reeves and Dad sharing some joke, my mother turned to me <clears throat> and her eyes seemed to say to me, I'm sorry, I don't like this any more than you do, but what can I do? But what she really, what she really said was, we won't be long, 
will be home soon. And I watched as they walked down the long path to the road. Mr Reeves and my father walking in front with my mother and Mrs Reeves walking subservently behind uh, until they disappeared into the distance. Mrs Reeves was wearing the pelt of a fox around her neck, a fashion accessory uh, which was popular at the time and suited, I thought, in my prejudiced way to her demeanour. And I was left with Ralph. I suppose that parents assume that two boys of roughly the same age would be compatible and get along, but I didn't like Ralph. He was 15 and three years older than me, which in later life would have been no consequence at all, but as a pubescent child made a lot of difference. He didn't go to my school, he didn't live me in my neighbourhood, so the only time we met was on those evenings when I was dumped in his house for the convenience of our parents when they went out. I can't say that he bullied me, although I suspect that he did some people, particularly at school, but he made me do things that I didn't want to do and being a sort of prisoner in his house they were impossible to avoid but there was one thing that we had done before that I really wanted to do again which we could only do when his parents were out We sat around for a while, played some cards and listened a while to the radio. One wasn't allowed to listen to the radio very long because the batteries that operated them uh, didn't last very long. And then got very bored until I plucked up the courage to say, Will you show it to me again? Ralph knew what I meant, but he gruffly said, no. Why not? You showed it to me last week. If my dad were to find out, he'd thrash me within an inch of my life. You have no idea what he's like. Well, of course I could imagine, but since it wasn't uh, me that was going to suffer, I tried one more time. Ralph mulled over the situation for a long while and eventually said all right then but you'll have to earn it we went to the shed where Ralph selected a spade and then to the vegetable patch when we came back we went into his parents bedroom Ralph knelt down and pulled a leather suitcase from beneath the bed. I didn't know whether the nausea I felt was from the excitement of what I was about to see or from the worm that he had made me eat. He sprung the two brass locks and then tantalizingly lifted the lid like those ladies who I'd been told about who slowly remove one veil at a time, then pull back a linen cloth and there it lay. My hands were shaking as I lifted it up. The first time I'd held it, the weight had surprised me, so this time I held it in both hands. The 
cold steel glistened in the light from the window. The revolving bullet chamber clicked as I turned it. I put my finger on the trigger and imagined that I was on the beach repelling alone the German invaders. Until next time, goodbye.